Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the University of California Alumni Career Network, my name is Alfonso Salazar, and I am serving as the Alumni Regent Desk for the University of California. I am honored to be the moderator for today's uh, event focused on professional etiquette particularly after the pandemic shutdown and the societal conversations on anti-racism catalyzed by the George Floyd death and other injustices around our country. This program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni. Across our 10 campuses, we aim to equip you with information, insights, connections necessary to launch, grow, and expand your career. Throughout today's session, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speaker by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the event. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by an inspiring UC alumni, Tanya Erasso, PhD. Dr. Erasso is the founder and CEO of Liberate Psychological Consultation Services Incorporated, and an adjunct professor of psychology at both the University of San Francisco and John Day College of Criminal Justice, City University, New York. She's a published scholar who focuses on the behavioral health impacts of oppression and discrimination on marginal people. Alongside this, she is a clinical psychologist who uses evidence-based practices informed by liberation psychology and cultural responsive strength-focused care to help patients heal and reach their goals. During the pandemic and post-pandemic, um, her patient list has heavily centered on students, athletes, early career professionals, C-suite executives, um, who experience anxiety, mood disorder, and more importantly, burnout. Dr. Erasso is an alumni of UC Santa Barbara. Thank you for being part of us, being part of this webinar today. Thank you for having me. I also want to welcome our alumni community, uh, all of you attending today for being part of this wonderful session. Uh, as of Monday, we had over 660 alumni registered with well over a hundred questions submitted for this webinar. Thank you for taking your time out today uh, to connect with the University of California and learn something new to continue your own professional development. So given the amount of questions we received, we thought it would be beneficial to really kind of focus on um, kind of the top 10 theme questions that were submitted um, and also provide an opportunity uh, to answer some of your questions as well uh, at the end of the webinar. So to begin with, uh, Dr. Eraso, tell us a little bit more about your, your career journey. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are and your post-University of Santa Barbara uh, career. Yeah, I'm happy to. So I'm not the typical like know what you want to do and go do it person and I'm pretty proud of that actually um I'm a child of immigrants and my parents really prioritized education and a stable high income so their their vibe was kind of like you can be a doctor or a lawyer that's it right like that's your choice um but uh I went to UC Santa Barbara I, um got my degree in law and society and I thought okay I guess I'm gonna be a lawyer right um, so I took a year between what I thought was going to be undergrad and law school and I moved to New York city. I wanted to study for the LSAT and basically just like live a little bit, like see what's out there. Right. Um, but then once I started seeing what's out there, things shifted for me and I was like, I don't think I want to be a lawyer anymore. Um, and I remember when I told my dad this on the phone, he was in California and he legitimately like hung up the phone. He was so upset. Right. Um, but I think that that was coming from a place of fear for him, right? Where he was like, this is what I know can make money in this country. So like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Um, but I worked a few different jobs. I worked in a few different spaces. I like worked as a, a comedy club manager for a while because I always loved stand up comedy. So I was like, why not do that? Why not be in that? And then, 
Um, I worked in offices just to like make money <laughs> and figure out what I wanted. And I also talked to attorneys to see if I should just like power through it and become an attorney anyhow. Right. But I think during that time, I ended up figuring out like my why, right? Like, why do I want, why did I think I wanted to be an attorney? I'm like, what do I actually want to do with my life? Um, and when I thought about what I had wanted to do as an attorney, I had wanted to be a public defender and help black and brown youth bef- uh, like who needed legal intervention, right? But then I was like, I don't think I want to help them then. I, I want to help them before they get there, right? So I started looking at psychology, thinking like, well, maybe therapy and like after school activities and interventions can be really helpful before people need legal intervention, right? Um, so when I started looking at psychology, I was like, okay, well, um, like, I'll be honest, right? I'm like, I don't want to make money, right? I also, um, want a diversity of tasks in my workplace. Like I don't just want to do therapy. I don't just want to teach, right? So like I want to teach, I want to research, I want to do therapy. I want to do talks like this, right? Um, and I also wanted to feel like an immigrant parent success story. You know, I, I like wanted the title of doctor um, because I think people in this country usually that look like me usually don't get called that. Um, so it was partially a pride thing, but it was also like, well, the PhDs are the ones that are usually diagnosing um, mental health illness. Um, and I don't, when they look like me or kind of like from the same uh, population they're serving, they usually have a better read on, is this actually mental illness or is this something else, right? Um, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't over-pathologizing and I wanted to be part of that. Um, so I had to do some work to get into um, a fully funded uh, program because I was like, I, can't, I don't want to go into debt for this. Um, so I like was researching, did unpaid internships, I was working at restaurants, um, and then I got into my doctoral program at age 30. Um, but that gave me a really intense clarity of what my goals were during the program. I was like, okay, I need to get out of here on time and quickly, but I also need to be highly employable once I graduate. Right. So, uh, like publishing academic work, garnering awards, expanding my abilities, all of that, um, was what I was working on in my doctoral journey and trying as best as I could to like have a life outside of that too. Um, so luckily, once I graduated, I you know, worked for a while um, and also started my own psychology business, like focusing on the things I care about, just like therapy, coaching, consulting, um, doing presentations like this, you know, doing psychological evaluations, and then on the side, also doing a little teaching and researching. And I'm really happy where I am now. Um, and I don't think I would have been happy if I just went directly into law or directly into psychology without finding my sense of purpose or direction first. I'm so happy you took uh, the long path to get here today. Uh, When I look at you, I see success. Then I see a strong woman contributing and giving back to our society, especially our our young folks. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for your journey. Uh, It is quite inspiring. Um, You know, as immigrant uh, growing up, there is always that sense of wanting to make your parents proud. Um, but in that process, there's also a realization that you also have to make yourself uh, equally as proud. And um, I think you've been able to accomplish that. I grew up in Boyle Heights uh, in East Los Angeles and had a chance to go to UC Berkeley. Um, and my parents really didn't know exactly where that was. Um, and uh, it's been an, an amazing journey for myself as well. Um, uh, unlike many of the other regions from the University of California, I'm a working regent. I work for uh, a large global auditing accounting firm, and I'm very excited by our topic today to talk about kind of etiquette in the workplace and uh, looking forward to providing as many tips as we can to our our listeners. Um, So I guess the, the first question is, yeah, how has the pandemic changed the workplace? And it's such a tricky question because you kind of have to have a baseline of what the workplace was before the pandemic. And I think we kind of forget a, a lot about that, but wanted to get your thoughts and perspectives on that. Yeah, definitely. And this is such a great question because 
I think the pandemic has changed the workplace for different settings um, in different ways, right? So for like office, uh, healthcare settings, even teaching and like conferences and stuff, suddenly remote work or broadcast are not only like possible, but they're pretty common, right? So, um, you know, to be honest, despite many people, like disabled people, people from rural areas or like busy parents, um, and even our planet, like our actual ecosystem, having been able to benefit from remote work pre-pandemic, it just wasn't as available for the average person. So now business owners, business leaders, they need to be flexible and have shifted away from fully in-person work in some places, right? Um, and in the pandemic, like we did shut down, right, um, in those, uh, a lot of those sectors. But uh, in some sectors, it's like, new flexibility has remained right like allowing for hybrid work styles so that's like partially in person partially remote right or even just fully remote um but some sectors they just have it you know despite research showing that employees are more productive in their preferred environments um and many prefer some sort of remote work so um you know when we think about like retail and restaurant settings uh Options like curbside pickup, contactless delivery, uh, lower monetary thresholds for shipping, all that continues to be utilized. Um, and there are less workers willing to do these jobs now. And some employers have increased their pay for them. So in some of these sectors, like the etiquette, which I know is a loaded term, right? Because like who decide who designs and decides etiquette and professionalism, like those are usually people in power and they design it based on their values and all that. But regarding workplace etiquette, people might no longer be willing to like meet up for a coffee or like attend a bunch of meetings in person or even virtually, right? Because they're tired and they've seen that it's not as mandatory as it once seemed. Um, and it makes me think of this term that got pretty popular, um, probably like 2020, but like mostly 2022 of like quiet quitting. I'm not sure if that's one that you're familiar with. Um, but I actually really despise this term and the, and the concept around it. But it's the idea that, um, you know, people are doing the minimum requirements of one's job and putting in like no more time or effort or enthusiasm than, than absolutely necessary. And the term doesn't really make sense because nobody actually quits. They just do their job and collect your pay, right? Um, but, you know, if we think about the context of quiet quitting, like when the pandemic hit, employee safety for some occupations often took priority over productivity, which was huge. Like that hasn't been the case usually. You know, like many people were told to stay home Many of the essential workers were given masks and PPE. Um, protocols were put into place to keep people safe. You know, did this all work perfectly seamlessly in an equitable fashion? No. But, you know, what did employees learn from that? Well, like with global pandemic, inflation, um, usually women being taxed with an even bigger like second shift um, at home. So like tasks of work outside of their workplace, right? Um, managers leaving their jobs more often because of the increased responsibilities and demands like all of that stuff highlighted for a lot of people this growing disconnect between employees and their employers you know so basically like why gonna why am i gonna work my butt off and risk my life and sanity you know because that's really hard labor right for these peanuts right like it's not that much money so there was an overall decline in employee satisfaction. Um, and usually it was related to like clarity of expectations. Like, what are we supposed to do? What do you want from me? Um, seeing other opportunities to learn and grow that were out there, uh, wanting to feel cared about um, and wanting a connection to their organization's mission or purpose, right? So like the mentality really became like, let me make my money without taking the skin off my back. You know, and I can do the bare minimum, which, by the way, is fine. You know, like you're hitting your job requirements um, or people thinking like, if I can, let me find a job that cares about me and that I align with. Um, and this is especially so for younger employees. Um, I won't get into the numbers about it, but there's a Gallup poll that shows that um, Gen Z and younger millennials in particular 
have shown a decline in engagement and employer satisfaction because of the or throughout and because of the pandemic, right? Well, and I shouldn't say because of the pandemic, but during that time, because they didn't feel like supported by their workplace. So all that to say, I'm um, sorry, I'm a talker, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so all that to say the workplace now has to be a place where flexibility is embraced, right? And that collaboration with employees happens, you know, like asking them what they want instead of demanding they come back into the office setting just because commercial real estate is sitting empty, right? And workplaces have needed to be more transparent because now you have employees asking why, you know, like, why can't you pay me more? Why do I need to come in and commute for hours um, just to sit and do a job I can do at home, right? Or you also have consumers asking why, right? Like, why are you increasing your prices? Why can't you continue offering special hours for like elderly and meal compromised people, right? So for some companies, this means designing solutions that allow for a mix of in-person congregating and then virtual interaction with their colleagues and clients. Um, and many companies are reimagining their corporate offices to create more of like community hubs where workers can collaborate as opposed to be forced to just sit in their desks and, and be around each other. Um, but there's also, you know, a, a plea for more inputs and consent from these top-down hierarchies, you know, like asking their employees in these non-adversarial ways, like what they prefer in terms of workplace rules and norms moving forward. Um, and there's actually a, a two great books that I recommend that um, uh, talk about, you know, one of them talks about workplaces and the value of employees working cross sectors to demand change. And one of them's called um, Work Won't Love You Back, like how devotion to our jobs keeps us exploited, exhausted, and alone by Sarah Jaffe. Um, and I think that's a, a great book, especially for like young first generation uh, employees and workers to, to read, right? Because we're often told like, you just got to work hard, right? But the pandemic has shown us like, yeah, but they can put our safety first. Um, so why can't that be the norm, right? Um, and then there's also another great book about resisting grind culture um, because it sees it as an arm of like white supremacy and exploitation of melanated bodies. And that one's Rest is Resistance of Manifesto by Trisha Hersey. So those are some of the ways that workplaces have changed because of the pandemic and then also some good reading material about protecting your peace. You know, I think your your comments about the employees asking why is so important these days. Uh, and I think employers need to really kind of understand how to put their arms around that and embrace that. Um, we've always talked about, uh, you know, kind of empowerment, self-empowerment, uh, and, and the asking of the why is, is, is an arm of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think kind of critical. And I think those companies that are, have been successful on the back end of the pandemic and it, have been able to kind of embrace some of these conversations, some of these conversations of collaboration and flexibility and allowing folks to uh, be, continue to be as productive as they were before the pandemic. Because at the end of the day, um, it, 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 it's really about production and our, our ability to feel positive about, about ourselves in producing or not only ourselves, but the team that we work with. You know, just very quickly, a lot of us kind of work in, in office space. Um, any two or three high topic uh, tips for folks who work in the office space and etiquette within the, the post-pandemic world? Yeah. Um... So this might sound a little contradictory to what I was just saying, um, because when it comes to etiquette and professionalism with some of the workplaces, like, yes, the pandemic has changed the workplace and mindset, but it doesn't always look that way in practice. So I would say it just depends on where you live, where you work, who your management is, you know, like whether the office etiquette or environment has changed, but um, really uh, for yourself, you know, if you feel like, comfortable to assert some of your boundaries about like I want to limit in-person meetings right or if I work um, in, in an office type setting um, and I want to wear a mask like is that like can I still wear one like can I ask people to wear masks when I first meet them right um, 
a lot of people are back to like shaking hands and, and even not washing their hands, you know? So feeling comfortable about like, how do I want to engage with people? Like, am I okay with washing hands uh, or excuse me, shaking hands? And then how do I kind of like discreetly like sanitize afterwards? Cause I don't want to be like offensive to people. Right. Um, but I think what ends up happening is that a lot of our most vulnerable employees end up having to fend for themselves in terms of safety. Um, so like, you know, disabled and, you know, compromised people, um, but they can always like try and advocate for COVID testing when they're meeting in large groups or if they travel for work, advocating for reimbursement for quarantining costs, you know, if they live with other people and don't want to come home and potentially infect them. Right. Um, but I, I just do want to be transparent too. I know that that can uh, take a lot of uh, privilege and like comfort and or feeling comfortable and being um, uh, confrontational sometimes about things. So just negotiating for yourself, like what feels worth it and what are the things that I do want to ask for and what are the things that I do want to hold a boundary on. You know, taking care of yourself is not being privileged, right? Uh, feeling good about yourself, your safety in particular is, is not something that we should apologize for. And I think uh, in, in many of the industries that I work with, um, we're beginning to see that openness and supportive of employees. Um, um, you know, there's, there's also a lot of questions that were asked about networking and, you know, how do, how do we do that in today's world? I mean, we're still virtual, uh, today, uh, which is fabulous because we get the word out to more people. Um, but there's still an opportunity for us to need to get out and meet people, interact with people, share our ideas with people. Um, a few thoughts about networks and and uh, tips for individuals about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've actually, through the pandemic, had a lot of uh, patients who felt like this job isn't working for me, so I'm, I'm going to leave, right? And then feeling like, oh, I how do I network with people? How do I get my resume out there and read? Because I know there are a lot of people applying for jobs. So I would say, firstly, reach far and wide, right? Like tech allows you to, to reach people across the globe or the state, and you should do it. Like you should use this resource, right? Um, it doesn't have to be that you're like moving um, across the globe or across the state, right? You can if you want to, but. Um, the network doesn't have to be confined to the small area that you're in, right? And try networking by having genuine conversations with people. Um, one thing I've noticed, uh, maybe maybe this pops up more in therapy, but people really love to talk about themselves and that's great, right? So ask them about their work path, like ask someone about what their journey was, right? But do it because you want to learn, right? And just be warned that like if you're if you're inviting someone to coffee but you actually want to get a job from them, they're gonna sniff it out immediately. Right. But if you try to talk to make a connection and not just to get something, you're increasing your network like by a lot. Right. Um, there's actually another good book book recommendation here um, that discusses finding your path and work and covers networking in this like more sincere way. Um, and it's called Designing Your Work Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. Um, I think that's a great place to look at things, um, get some input there. But uh, with networking, people often feel like, well, but I, you have to be extroverted to do that, right? So if you're an introvert, you can try email or something virtual like Zoom, right? Uh, you can meet other introverts in your field, right? They'll feel just as content to talk with you and not like a huge big group, right? So. Um, you can also ask the more extroverted friend to help support you in, in networking, right? And just another thing I think that's pretty helpful is just joining things other people in your field will go to or like, right? So when you go to those events, try not to stick to just your people, right? But meet new people with some sort of like power or pull, right? Don't be, um, don't feel uncomfortable like approaching someone just being like, oh, hi. You know, like I read your book or like, you know, I, I saw your LinkedIn profile. Um, and I think that something to think about when you're younger is that your current colleagues, they might actually be those people that are uh, in positions of power in the future. 
So just like treat them well and help each other out. Um, not necessarily because you're trying to get something out of them, but you have a connection now that you can start working on. Right. Um, I will say just kind of like winding down here about it, like just really use the privilege of being a student or an early career professional or like a career switcher, right? Because a lot of people like to feel like they're helping the next generation or a generation who's like starting afresh, right? So don't be afraid to reach out and ask someone to talk. You'd be surprised how many people are like, oh, you're an early career professional. Let me tell you how I did it. Right. Um, and that can lead to a lot of opportunities down the road. I I'd be such a, yeah, that's a great opportunity, right? For, for many of our younger folks uh, in their careers, because people always want to help other individuals. Uh, yes. Alumni always want to help current UC students and people go out of their way to do that. So that's a great um, yeah, I always love. I, I love your thought about um, joining the things. Um, mm-hmm. What I'm seeing in the industry right now, in the field I work in, um, there are clubs being developed. There are forums being provided to all employees to to participate in in, in an interest or in a club, and and there's time given to do that. And it's just a great way to kind of expand your network a little bit. And, and go join something you would typically not be interested in. Uh, and just to learn a little bit more uh, outside of your comfort zone. And you may find, um, you know, some exciting um, opportunities there as well. Um, and I think just kind of allowing yourself the space to be a little uncomfortable is typically results in a very good thing. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. One last concrete tip from my, from my perspective on networking. Uh, especially from a, a digital perspective, um, I tend to kind of put together a, a list of maybe you know, five to ten individuals that I want to network with, um, and I tend to reach out to them. I call them touch points, maybe once a month or once every other month, and it's just a simple hello, uh, a simple hey, I read something in the newspaper or something, wanted to get your perspective. Um, and it's really all about kind of the long-term relationships than the immediate, I want a job or I want an internship. And um, like you said, a, a lot of these individuals evolve into bigger positions that you know, in the future, based on those relationships, um, you may have a much easier um, opportunity or be in a better position to ask for that assistance. Yeah, definitely. So as we go back to work, um, and I know I experienced this before the pandemic, I was on a plane once a month. I was traveling the state. I was traveling throughout the Pacific Southwest. And when we came back to work, there was just a lot of excitement of traveling, of getting back to the office. Uh, what does that all really mean? Am I putting myself at risk for my family, for myself? Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, how individuals are, are, are dealing with anxiety going back to the workplace and, and really just trying to manage themselves as they maneuver, uh, in today's world? Yeah, definitely. And it's a great question because I mean, I would say most people have experienced some sort of anxiety about like, am I going to go back? When am I going to go back? What's happening? Right. How's it going to go when I go back? Um, I would say make a plan, right? Like think through how you're going to greet people. Think through how you're going to say no and hold a boundary. Like even practicing saying stuff like, oh yeah, I think a company lunch is a great idea, but I'm only able to attend if we're eating outdoors. Like is that, is outdoor seating available there? Right. I like practicing saying those things so it doesn't feel like you're so uncomfortable and can't ask. And then also communicating your plan, whether it's like to your family, your roommates, your job right? Discussing what you feel um, is negotiable in your plan, right? Trying to problem solve together. It doesn't have to be like, it's my way or the highway. This is what I'm doing. Like, hey, these are the concerns I have. This is what I'd like. Um, How can either you, like as the employer or you as my family, support me in this? Um, And then if the anxiety is negatively impacting your day-to-day life, like, Come see me or another therapist, right? Um, that's what we're here for. 
Um, but if cost is an issue, there is actually another resource I want to share. Um, but there's this great organization that's uh, located in Australia, but they're called the Center for Clinical Interventions, and they offer free self-help type materials on their website. Um, so you can go there and download some like workbooks. Uh, if you're like, I'd love to go to therapy, but I either don't have the time or I don't have the money or I don't have insurance to cover it. Um, you can work on some of these uh, evidence-based practices through the workbook on your own time. You kind of touched upon it already, but work-life balance, uh, working from home, the hybrid, the trying to pull it together, the family, the self, um, tips, thoughts, uh, advice for folks. Yeah, I feel like this is one that comes up a lot for people, even if they're working from home or working um, in the office, right? But um, in general, people find meaning in their daily rituals, so like getting ready to leave home or like commuting and grabbing their cup of coffee or filling their water bottle before they sit down at their desk. Like all that stuff is pretty mean meaningful and also signals to you. But like, okay, I'm about to work or I'm about to go home, right? So creating a routine can be really helpful. Um, creating a routine for starting work and then also for ending your work day. And then also a routine for the days that you're like at home or in the office, like creating routines around both of those things. Right? And I would say, of course, most importantly here is like trying to create a separation from work in your home life. So it can be like physical separation. Like if you're lucky enough to, to have, uh, you know, a home office or something, great. But if you don't and you're like, well, I, don't know, I share this apartment with like six roommates, you know, uh, being like, there's a specific chair that I sit in and that's where I do my work, right? Um, but also creating like a mental or emotional separation from work and home life, right? I was like, after X PM, I stopped working. I don't let myself feel bad about it either. Like I've done my work and now this is time for me to do my other stuff, right? And then also carving out time for yourself, the same way that you schedule things like meetings, scheduling time or carving, protecting out time for yourself, or right? like on your, the evenings and weekends, really prioritizing yourself. Um, and I would say in those routines that you've adopted, really create flexibility so you don't get bored or lonely, right? Like um, making sure that it's not like every day that you're finishing work and just like watching your favorite show by yourself. I mean, if you're into that, great, but if you start feeling lonely or you just start getting bored, like, try a new language class, like whip up a new breakfast drink, always trying to make it a little bit flexible and novel, right? And I would say the last thing that to me is like the most important thing is that you don't walk back this work-life balance you've created unless it's because you want to or for a really good reason. And to me, because I feel bad is not a good reason to walk back the work-life balance you've created. Right? So those are some good ways, I think, to maintain work-life balance. So now that we've created these work-life balances, um, why do we best adjust the work environment while keeping our own identities? Yeah, that can be a tricky one, right? Um, I would say the biggest asset here would be to find a work environment that feels doable for you, right? Um, I won't talk too much about like my my uh, journey here, but I will just say like clinical psychology is a really like white, cis, hetero, female space, right? And I didn't quite feel like I was seeing myself in the classes I was taking and the people I was like training under. Um, but I would say like you can still find people that are like you, right? Um, you don't, you won't need to feel like you need to jeopardize who you are if the work environment and culture feels like it's a good match. So go explore places, look at what their, the makeup of their employees look like, the makeup of their, um, their higher ups looks like. And then once you feel like you're in a potentially comfortable space, just show up in the workspace how you feel comfortable, right? Like if you want to share about your personal life, fine. But also keep in mind, like oftentimes workplaces are not safe, right? Particularly if you're a minority there or if the boundaries are really blurred at your job or, or like maybe it's like super competitive, the people that are working there. So it's not to say don't be yourself. You should definitely be yourself, but only share the parts of you that you want at work. Um, and I would definitely say if you have paid time off, like please use it. 
Um, if you're self-employed, create a savings plan for your own paid time off. And I say that because we all need to recharge and rest and feel free to be our full selves. And we might not always feel that way at work, and that's okay, but we can do things for ourselves to to create that um, balance. You know, if you don't mind, I, I like to kind of dig a little deeper into something you said. Um, and any tips on individuals who may not feel comfortable in their workplace because they don't see people like themselves or that work like them? Yeah. Yeah. And that can be really rough because I think people become sometimes a little bit too myopic where they're like, I need to see someone in my exact workplace that looks like me, right? Um, you can find your people, even if it's not in your exact workplace, or even if they don't look exactly like you, right? Um, you can find allies and mentors, uh, whether they're in like higher up positions or people who are like colleagues who have been there for a while and they can show you the ropes and feel comfortable with them. Um, also, you know, one thing that I ended up doing uh, during my uh, uh, doctoral journey was like, I didn't see people that looked like me. So um, I joined a group for like graduate students of color across all disciplines. And we were all having the same experience, you know, and it was sad for our society, but it was deeply comforting that I wasn't alone or that I wasn't going crazy. Right. So it doesn't always have to be that like, a one-for-one -one match of like, I need to see this person in my workspace, but could it be there are people that I align with, that I look like, that I feel comfortable with across different sectors that understand my situation and can also be helpful. Right. And I, I would just say lastly, like with finding allies and, and mentors particularly, that um, try to make sure that um, you remember that they might not hold your same values and just be mindful of that, right? That there's this um, famous uh, Zora Neale Hurston quote, right? It's like all skin folk ain't kin folk. And it really just suggests that like people of color might actually be um, agents of white supremacy and may actively discriminate against people of their same racial group. But I think that can apply to all identities, right? So remembering that there, there can sometimes feel like an alienating experience if you're looking for someone who looks just like you and they say something like oh well you know that uh don't don't listen to what they said even though it was like wildly inappropriate uh, and discriminatory towards you just like keep your mouth shut like maybe they didn't even mean it that way right um and then asking yourself if you know do i not like what they're saying but maybe it can be of some benefit to me or it is what they're saying going against all my values right and if that's the case, you can kind of like throw their remarks in the trash, right? They they can still be a mentor to you, but it doesn't have to be that they align with you all the time, right? And so just utilize your allies and mentors, but be mindful of what your values are. I think that's so important. You know, um, one of the things um, that I've seen, I've been blessed. I've had the opportunity to work in government and now in corporate America. And one of the things um, I think that's interesting is when individuals of color come into corporate America, they feel like they're going through the same, through issues for the first time, right? And there's others who are different generations who've gone through those same issues and are still working through those same issues. And I think there's uh, an opportunity for you know, everyone in that workplace to just understand that they're all on the same page, that may be at different places of their career path. But folks are dealing with the same issues. Um, and I think the ability to come together and, and really collaborate and, and just be it, create a sense of community, I think helps oftentimes, you know, with that. Um, and that's, I think, super important in, in supporting each other along our career journeys. You know, I, I do want to turn a little bit to uh, a, a topic that um, unfortunately still exists uh, in our workplace. Um, and that's a topic of, you know, microaggressions um, in the workplace. Uh, unfortunately, it's still still part of our lives. Um, and I'm so happy that we're a bit more enlightened on on the topics and our, have the ability to, to discuss them. 
But if someone is you know, experiencing microaggressions in the workplace, what should they do? And maybe we should just take a step back and, and talk a little bit about what does microaggressions really mean? Yeah, so not that I love microaggressions themselves, but I love microaggression theory. And this is a lot of what I ended up researching in my doctoral um, journey. So microaggressions, it's a term that uh, was dubbed in the 1970s, um, but it means like it's a statement or an action or an incident that can be indirect, subtle, even unintentional, but it's discriminatory against you know members of a, a marginalized group. So it can be like race or ethnicity based or disability based. It can be like intersectional. So it goes, it kind of attacks all the person's identities, right? But um, the term, uh, you know, one thing I just want to make clear is that the terms derived from, or I shouldn't say derived, but it, it gets its flavor from economic principles of micro and ma macro systems. So the micro part of the term doesn't relate to discrimination being small or unimportant. If anything, these microaggressions are hugely impactful to people and very hurtful, but the micro part relates to the individual level, like microaggressions between two people. So I would say if you're if you're experiencing a microaggression at work, first like just validate that for yourself, right? Like it's real, it's happened. You're not you're not making it up, right? You don't have to figure out why they said it or why they did it. Um, but because microaggressions can be perpetual and compounding, it might seem like you have a reaction to this one microaggression, um, but. It could be that you're reacting to like all of them that you've had that day or that workplace or this life, right? And that's okay. Just like allow yourself to feel that. And just be careful too, because depending on your work environment and your colleagues' level of awareness, they might not notice the microaggressions or they might write it off like it's no big deal, right? And that can feel really isolating. Um, so just allow yourself to like, yes, this happened, right? And then before you decide to speak up or take action, just asking yourself, like, what's my aim here? Like, am I wanting something structural to change? Do I want to distance myself from this employee or the microaggressor? Do I want to speak up and state a boundary? Um, and from there, ask yourself, like, okay, is what I'm asking for actually possible? You know, do I need this to change or do I need acknowledgement from that person or that structure or that institution? Or can I provide it for myself somehow? The the reason I say that, I'm not I'm not saying it to be like, oh, don't don't take any action. But just that as a therapist, I see that oftentimes people react out of sheer hurt or anger, you know, and they'll freeze or they'll lash out, but they don't take the time to just process their emotions and figure out what they really want. So I encourage you to ask yourself what you want. And then find some emotional support from trusted sources, whether it's friends or coworkers, and be really clear about what you need from them, right? Saying stuff like, okay, listen, I just I just need a vent. I don't want advice right now. I just want you to hear how messed up this was, right? Or like ask them if they can speak up for you when something like that happens again, because you were just like too stunned to react, right? Um, and it, the second part of the question is really important too, about just like retaliation. Um, because if you do decide to act, like, yeah, retaliation is real, right? In, in a perfect world, we could call stuff out and not fear losing our jobs or our network at work or um, anything like that, but we're not in a perfect world. And it's typically harder for those people who are microaggressed against because they're from marginalized groups. So we know it's harder for people like us to, to be taken seriously as victims or to be listened to, right? So find some actual allies that have some power and can potentially protect you. So this can be someone inside or outside of your workplace. Now, maybe maybe you know someone who's on the board of directors of the organization. Maybe there is a manager in a different department who is like-minded, like-valued, and wants to help. Um, maybe there's a friendly employment attorney that you know through a friend of a friend or something who just has lots of resources to share. Right? So, um, it's up to you if you want to take action or not, but I would just mostly suggest that you take care of yourself and find support from others. Thank you for that. I know uh, this is an issue that affects all of us. Uh, and um, 
you know, I've experienced, you know, microaggressions about race here in the office almost uh, annually. And in, in many respects, I get angry. Uh, and I, and I, and I want to lash back, right? But I've also understood the, the need to kind of maybe not react in the moment, but also kind of empower myself to have the conversation with that individual at a later date. Uh, and ha- share with them how their comment made me feel or how their comment had a negative impact with the community I come from. And, and oftentimes after those conversations, it's, it's enlightening for them because it was never intended. Um, but nonetheless, it's hurtful. Um, and it's okay to be angry and hurtful. Um, but having the ability to have those networks and, 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 and react appropriately, um, yeah, is incredibly important. And I think that's different for everyone. So thank you for kind of laying that out. So about 30 years ago, I left UC Berkeley wanting to change the world. Uh, and I think my wife and I are still on that, uh, on that path of, of trying to bring change to our communities. I sure hope that there's someone uh, on this webinar today that is interested in changing the culture of their organizations. You know, what kind of advice can you give those individuals? Yeah, so this is a great question because work cultures can and do change, but it's hard to do it alone, right? So try not to be a hero about it and just take work with or formulate a team, right? Find people who want the change and people who can also support the change, right? I'm, I'm not here trying to tell people don't reach for the stars and affect this like long lasting structural change, like go ahead and do that. But also remember that change doesn't have to be seismic to have a real result. Um, and I will say that uh, it's a little sad for me to say, but that if you want to affect change and you're working with management on doing that, like show why this will benefit the company or the work. Um, people tend to listen when it makes sense to them. And it might not always make sense to them because it's like, oh, it's inequitable, right? They're like, okay, but our profits are up, right? And you're like, okay, but how does this affect their bottom line? Right? Um, and you could like, listen, you could protest and demand change. I'm not against that. You know, if we look at the great efforts that are going on right now with like the Writers Guild of America or sag or even like the, the hotel worker strikes or the unionization campaigns at Amazon and Starbucks or even, I don't know if there are any um, soccer fans, but I've been watching the World Cup like crazy right now. And that Nigerian women's national team for soccer, they're working with Thief Pro right now, which is uh, uh, like a unionizing organization to help demand their back pay and contractual obligations that they're owed from the uh, football federation. So those efforts and demonstrations are amazing, right? But they take lots of planning and organizing. And again, get back to like that don't do it alone mentality, um, which is wonderful. But I just imagine people in this webinar uh, are looking for smaller changes in their culture of their organization. So that's what my answer is focused on. But I would just say, aim to leave an organization better than you found it. And it'll be a better place for you to work and hopefully for people after you. So if you want to make a culture change, just try. That's great advice. Just change uh, the place, your environment, make it a little better than what you found it is just always great advice. And it's that incremental change that really makes a difference over time. Uh, so thank you. I think we have a few, I think we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, and let me take a quick look. Um, um, one question that's come in uh, is around dress code uh, in the office place and feeling comfortable with that. Prior to uh, the pandemic, I wore suits and t-shirts. That was the only thing in my wardrobe. Um, um, little, uh, do you have any thoughts around um, office dress codes these days? Yeah, so I'm not sure if you're noticing, but I'm like wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> Great. But I... I'm also someone that doesn't like the like very stiff kind of like workplace uh, uh, uniform kind of. Um, but I think there are ways of managing this where it's like, you know, not to go against how you feel, but there are ways to make the office dress code feel more yours. Um, and I also like this is just like my own little tip. I start off being more formal and then I slowly peel back the layers where I'm like in a t-shirt and leggings <laughs> and it's like i've been there enough where people don't quite mention it um 
But there are ways where you can make it feel more comfortable for you. And I would just suggest trying different ways, right? And if it's worth it to you, not following the dress code and seeing if that's something you can compromise uh, with so you don't get like written up or get in trouble, um, but explain like why you're doing it and, and why it's helpful for you um, to feel more comfortable at work. You know, uh, if you work in an office environment, um, and there's still a hybrid culture, I think your dress code could also be hybrid as well. Um, there are certain days uh, in my office where uh, a vast majority of people are in the office, and you know, those are the days uh, I put on uh, more of a dress shirt uh, and slacks, uh, and there's other days where I'm in a, you know, more of a, a polo and jeans. Um, and, and I think we're still all kind of working those norms out Right, so I think pushing the envelope is uh, is a good thing as well. Um, but really, just trying to feel comfortable and be part of the organizational culture is is critical. Um, let's see any other uh, questions that are coming in. Uh, do you have any insights in on the interview process and job hunting during uh, the pandemic or post pandemic uh, in terms of professional etiquette? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, so this is a good one. I mean, I think of employee-wise, like if you're looking for a job, I think you can still lead with a formal air, right? Like sending emails that are like, dear so-and-so, uh, remembering that this isn't like text, it's email, and uh, email is almost like a written record of how you engage. Um, it can be looked back on, it can, you know, people can get perceptions of you based off that. Um, also, when it comes to like managers and employers, um, I it depends on the sector, but some of these places really need to hire, right? So um, if you feel like, oh, I don't hit all the requirements of this job listing, I don't know, you should maybe just try, right? Like try as much as you can to uh, tailor your either cover letter, your resume, make sure that you're using the same words um, that the job listing posts um, but also use your networking, right? Oftentimes places will hire someone based on a recommendation from someone or they, they know someone um, in their network, right? So I would say, you know, things haven't quite changed from what I've seen in the pandemic, um, but there is also more flexibility that you can ask for if you do get hired. Like, can I get like a hybrid uh, workplace at all? setting situation going on. Do you pay for more benefits? Can I get home office equipment? Um, can I uh, work, you know, on certain days during the week or certain hours, right? So there's maybe some more flexibility that can happen too. You know, I, I think um, first impressions are still very important. Um, and that first impression uh, as you enter an interview, as you meet someone for the first time, whether it's virtually or in person, are still uh, very important to really kind of understanding uh, each other as human beings. Um, and sometimes those impressions, unfortunately, kind of carry on. Um, so that you know, anything you could do to you know, be a, a tad more formal or be on your game or understand or, or have a plan, um, I think it's just you know in, as important today as it was in um, twenty. Let's see, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, do you have advice on small talk at the beginning of a meeting? Uh, especially when especially when meetings are on Zoom. So um, I think actually I'm trying to remember if this is in the uh, uh, designing your work life book or if maybe I like read it somewhere else, but they suggest that small talk in the beginning of meetings is really like difficult um, in the sense of like people will just kind of group up and talk like two people, especially on Zoom. It's hard because like maybe some people are off camera, some people are talking and it's hard to, you know, uh, talk and not not trample over each other's words. But trying to find connection can be really helpful for fostering cohesion with the group and getting people kind of like more interested in the meeting. Right. So trying to see like, oh, do you guys see that, uh, you know, that uh, 
we have a new coffee type that's offered in the like rec room or um, how was your commute? Or if you're on Zoom, like, um, how, what do you eat for lunch, right? I know some of these things can feel a little bit intrusive, um, but just trying to foster connection can be the best way of trying to, to engage in small talk. And it really depends on your comfort level, but also like what what's going on with your coworkers. Like some people don't want to be too personal. That's okay. Like meet them where they're at. Um, or some people are feel comfortable telling you about like, all their kids' extracurricular activities. That's fine, right? Just try and foster connection as, as opposed to just like how's the weather. No, that's, uh, it's so tricky these days. And I think as I lead meetings sometimes and as we're waiting for people to join, I oftentimes just ask a silly question. Um, who's your favorite superhero? Or, um, you yeah, know, what's your favorite uh, ice cream flavor? And as people are piling on to the Zoom, it becomes... A, a community discussion, um, but it, you know those are just little tricks that uh, I think have been helpful for me over time. So, Doctor Nas, so before we end our time today, the time's just really flown by. Thank you so much for all of your insight uh, and perspectives. Uh, greatly, greatly appreciated. But is there one last piece of, of feedback guidance you would like to leave with our audience? Uh, one thing you really want our audience to walk away with today. Yeah. So, you know, I know we've been talking about work a lot um, because that's like the focus of this webinar, but I know that there are so many isms out there in the world that can work for or against you. And as employees, we often are made to feel like we have to prove our worth to our employers. And it can be scary to think of losing a job or leaving a job. But I would just say, keep in mind that if a job is not working for you, that you can change that, right? There are so many careers, so many jobs, so many environments out there. And in a world that pri prioritizes hustling and grinding culture, please prioritize yourself. Whether that's setting boundaries around in-person gatherings when you're immunocompromised or setting parameters around your work hours or finding a new place to get your check, right? Prioritize yourself because companies won't. And you mean a lot to the people around you. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful advice. And thank you for all that you do in keeping our community healthy. Um, and I encourage you know, everyone uh, on the webinar today to reach out if you do need help, if you do want to talk to someone. There are so many people out in our UC family who are willing, who are, who are standing by and ready to be helpful. So thank you once again, and congratulations on, on an amazing career. Um, thank you. We're getting close to the end. You know, on behalf of the University of California, yeah, thank you for joining today for the our UC Alumni Career Webinar. Thank you for uh, everyone at UC who make this possible. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to connect with uh, all of you today. Um, I appreciate uh, all the time you've made to connect with us. And I hope you've gained some valuable advice um, that will be helpful for your career. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Adasa, for your time, your generosity, and your commitment to the University of California. Um, great advice, great insights. Um, uh, I, I think we've all taken them to heart. Um, for those of you who've participated, um, please provide your feedback um, via the survey gizmo that you'll all be receiving uh, here shortly. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, read, considered, and definitely um, has an impact on future sessions as well. You know, in addition to that, there's many ways for alumni to give back. Uh, I invite all of you to sign up uh, as an alumni advocate on uh, UCAN, the UC Advisory Network. Uh, and that uh, link is going to be dropped into the chat. UCAN is a digital grassroots community that focuses on issues uh, that matter to UC, not only to UC staff, students, and alumni. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, advocate on behalf of our student community, our alumni community in Sacramento, and I meeting with different members of the legislature. I, I point them to just the hundreds and hundreds of individuals who have signed up 
and our grassroots advocates in our UCAN network. So it's something that I would encourage all of you to um, to participate, to be involved with, be involved with, and really kind of do little things that make a huge difference, uh, like ensuring that California fully funds the budget uh, for the University of California for the next fiscal year. Um, with that, uh, we hope to see you in October uh, for our next uh, UC Alumni uh, Network webinar focused on health equity. Um, please visit our website for more details. And with that, I'd like to wish all of you uh, a wonderful afternoon uh, and thank you for being part of our UC family. With that, have a wonderful day, everyone.